This video is going to cover chapter three, section one. Although water is the primary medium for life on earth, most of the molecules from which living organisms are made are based on the element carbon. Carbon's ability to form large and complex molecules has contributed to the great diversity of life. All of the many compounds discovered can be classified into two broad categories. We have organic compounds and inorganic compounds. Organic compounds must contain carbon. And normally they are also, um, they are also, and normally they also contain elements like hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Inorganic compounds may or may not contain carbon. And there are two, two, uh, two molecules or two types of molecules which generally contain carbon but are not organic. And those are uh, carbonates which is the ion CO3, which you'll learn in chemistry later on, and oxides, which is uh, carbon plus oxygen only. So for example, carbon dioxide, just because it contains carbon does not necessarily mean that it is organic, but organic compounds contain carbon atoms covalently bonded to other carbon atoms and to other elements, like I said, usually hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, excluding carbonates and oxides. So you have to remember those two groups are not organic. So what makes, car what, makes, what makes carbon so special? It is in the way that it bonds. Now a carbon atom, carbon uh, is element number six, which means it has six electrons. We know that the first level of um, electrons can hold a maximum of two electrons, which means the, the last four electrons are in level two. Level two can hold eight electrons. So that means that carbon is looking to share its four outer electrons and gain uh, through that sharing another four for a total of eight. To be stable, a carbon atom, like I said, needs eight electrons in its outermost energy level. Therefore, it readily forms four covalent bonds with other elements. But carbon is really special in that it doesn't necessarily have to form single bonds, which I will get to in a second. Carbon can form straight chains. It can also form branched chains. And something that's very unique to carbon is that it can form rings. It can bond to itself and form straight chains, branch chains, and rings. It can also form three different types of bonds. It can form a single bond when um, two atoms share one pair. I want you to make sure you pay attention to that one pair equals two electrons. So carbon shares one and the other element shares one. It can also form a double bond where two atoms share two pairs of electrons and it can, it can uh, form a triple bond, which is atoms that share three pairs of electrons. So a really, really important point, which I want to stop and emphasize now and let you know, like you, you want to remember this, the reason why organic compounds have so much variety, there's like tons and tons and tons of different types of organic compounds. The reason for that is because of carbon bonding, because carbon can bond to itself in straight chains, branched chains and rings, and also because carbon can form single, double, and triple bonds. All of these different varieties lead to a huge diversity of organic compounds because of the way that carbon can bond. There will be a question about that, I promise you. Okay, next part of organic compounds are functional groups. A functional group is a cluster or a group of atoms that influence the properties of the molecules they make. For example, we have uh, four functional groups here. Very, very, very common um, functional groups that you'll see in both biology and chemistry. Hydroxyl, the structural formula is OH. Now, I want you to remember back to when we talked about polarity. And polarity in water, remember water is oxygen bonded to two hydrogens 
what makes a, a water polar is this bond between oxygen and hydrogen. So anytime that you see oxygen and hydrogen bonded together, I want you to think polar, 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 because of the difference in electronegativities, uh, oxygen will take the electrons most of the time. So because OH is polar, that's the property of this functional group. That means that it makes this compound also polar. That's a functional group. So the functional group has a specific property. When it's in a compound, it gives that compound the same property. Another example of a functional group is carboxyl. This is something else that you'll see uh, commonly in both biology and chemistry. It is a carbon bonded to a hydroxyl group. So this part's polar here and then double bonded to an O. So you would write this a formula COOH. You might see it written like that. But structurally, it's double bonded to an oxygen with a hydroxyl group on the side. Another one that you'll see is an amino group. This can be condensed to NH2. You see it here. And you see it here in the compound along with a carboxyl group. And the last one is phosphate. Phosphate is PO4. And you see that here. A big uh, function of phosphate is with ATP. I talked about it in the last uh, chapter in the section on energy. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And what happens is when you remove one of the phosphate groups, energy is released. So that's how energy works for your cells. That's functional groups. Okay, again, hydroxyl is important to life. Uh, alcohol, uh, organic, uh, alcohols are organic compounds that are a long hydrocarbon chain. What I mean by hydrocarbon is that you see all of the rest of this molecule is just hydrogens and carbons. That's why it's called hydrocarbon. And then you have one end, you have a hydroxyl group and that hydroxyl group makes the hydrocarbon chain polar at that end. This end is not polar because there's no OH there. Okay, next topic is large carbon mole molecules. So the main point of this chapter is to talk about the molecules of life, these giant macromolecules that are made from smaller repeated units called monomers. Remember mono means one, I think mer is like a unit, so one unit. Um, and so we put monomers together to form polymers. You might've heard the term polymer before. Um, and this happens through different kinds of reactions. But the molecules that build up life are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. I'm going to talk about that in a different video later. But today I just want to focus on how these big molecules are put together and the terminology that we use when we talk about how they're put together. So monomer is the basic building block for each of these types of molecules. Each monomer will have a specific name, depending on if you're talking about a carbohydrate, a protein, a lipid, or a nucleic acid. They all have different base units. But in general, we call those base units monomers. They are uh, bound to one another to form complex molecules called polymers. Remember, poly means many. And we can build even bigger molecules by putting polymers together to make what are called macromolecules. Again, the term macro means very large, very large. Okay, so these are really big molecules. A protein is a macromolecule. So how do we put monomers together to form polymers? Okay, we do so through what's called a condensation reaction. If you know the term condensation, um, you should know that that is a water vapor turning into liquid water. And the process for this reaction is kind of reflected in that. So just whoop, really generally, I want to have my, yeah. Really generally, you've got here two monomers. You've got glucose and fructose, which are two simple sugars. You're going to take the hydrogen from one of those and the hydroxyl from another one. So what you have left over, if you take these two out, 
you have H and OH. Guess what that forms? H to O. There's your condensation part of the reaction because water is formed. And what you're left with is this singular oxygen atom that's by itself, and you have a completely empty bond right here. So then you end up having a bond formed there. So now you have two things that have been put together and it releases a water molecule. Okay, so hydrogen from one, hydroxyl from another one that forms one water molecule, and you free up that bond so that they can uh, attach together. So the opposite reaction, how do we take large things and split them up? Well, I'll see if you can try to figure this out. If during condensation, we put two small molecules together by taking water out, how do you think that we're going to break those two molecules up into single units again? We're going to put the water molecule back in. That's called hydrolysis. And again, vocab, hydro, lyse, is, this is process, lyse is to break apart, and hydro with water. So literally the process to break apart with water. That's what it boils down to, right? Remember when we translate from the Latin, we go backwards. So we start with the suffix, then the root, then the prefix. Because one water molecule is released during the formation of large molecules, adding the water back into the uh, compound will then break them down. I know you can't hear this. So we have monomers and we're going to put them together to form a polymer. So here's an example of one of the polymers that I was talking about, the protein. The monomer for protein is called an amino acid and you can see here how they're put together. So it's, there are different amino acids that are attached together. For carbohydrates, the monomer is glucose. I'm gonna go over all of this when, we, when I talk about each type of molecule specifically, I'll make a different video for each of those. But just as a, just to let you know how this works. So for carbohydrates, the monomer is glucose. And so here's gonna show you, you take the, you've got hydrogen on one side and you're gonna take the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group and you form a bond there. And then when you wanna break them down, you just add them back in, right? Hydro, water, lysis, break. And you're gonna just put them back. So now you have two separate monomers again. Oh, maybe I didn't talk about ATP yet. Oh, I thought I did. I guess not. Okay. I thought that was in the last chapter, but I guess that was just about activation energy. Okay. So now focusing on ATP, which will bring back the, fu the functional group phosphate. Energy for cells is available in the form of certain compounds that contain a large amount of energy in their structure. This is a structural formula for ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. You have the adenine, you've got a ribose in there, which is a sugar, and you've got three phosphate groups. When you take off the one phosphate group on the end, that releases energy. And you're gonna see this a lot when we study the different biochemical reactions in biology, like photosynthesis, cellular respiration, uh, even muscle contraction, all kinds of things where ATP is used. So that's how it works. Okay, so that's a cell. We haven't talked about that yet. Okay, so here's ATP. Again, in the red, that's adenine. That is a nitrogenous base, which is actually part of um, DNA as well. The blue one is the sugar. And then you've got three P's there. Each P represents a phosphate. When you take a phosphate off, because the bonds between the phosphates are high energy. When you break those bonds, it releases energy like that. And then you have adenosine diphosphate, ADP. So ADP plus P equals ATP. And you'll see that a lot. And so that energy then can be used for cellular activity. <laughs> 